Chapter 11, Part 1 of Aircraft and Submarines by Willis J. Abbott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Tomko. Beginnings of Submarine Invention, Part 1. In September 1914, the British fleet in the North Sea had settled down to the monotonous task of holding the coasts of Germany and the channels leading to them in a state of blockade. The work was dismal enough the ships tossing from day to day on the always unquiet waters of the north sea were crowded with jackies all of whom prayed each day that the german would come from hiding and give battle not far from the hook of holland engaged in this monotonous work were three cruisers of about twelve thousand tons each carrying seven hundred fifty five men and officers they were the cressy abukur and hoag not vessels of the first rank but still important factors in the British blockade. They were well within the torpedo belt, and it may be believed that unceasing vigilance was observed on every ship. Nevertheless, without warning, the other two suddenly saw the Abukur overwhelmed by a flash of fire, a pillar of smoke, and a great geyser of water that rose from the sea and fell heavily upon her deck. Incidentally followed a thundering explosion as the magazines of the doomed ship went off. Within a very few minutes, too little time to use their guns against the enemy had they been able to see him, or to lower their boats, the Abukur sank, leaving the crew floundering in the water. In the distance lay the German submarine U-9, one of the earliest of her class in service. From her conning tower, Captain Wedigan had viewed the tragedy. Now seeing the two sister ships speeding to the rescue, he quickly submerged. It may be noted that as a result of what followed, orders were given by the British Admiralty that in the event of the destruction of a ship by a submarine, others in the same squadron should not come to the rescue of the victim, but scatter as widely as possible to avoid a like fate. In this instance, the Hogue and the Cressy hurried to the spot whence the Abukur had vanished and began lowering their boats. Hardly had they begun the work of mercy when a torpedo from the now unseen foe struck the Hoag, and in twenty minutes she too had vanished. While she was sinking, the Cressy, with all guns ready for action, and her gunners scanning the sea in every direction for this deadly enemy, suddenly felt the shock of a torpedo, and her magazines, having been set off, followed her sister ships to the ocean's bed. In little more than half an hour, 36,000 tons of up-to-date British fighting machinery and more than 1,200 gallant blue jackets had been sent to the depths of the North Sea by a little boat of 450 tons carrying a crew of 26 men. The world stood aghast. With the feeling of horror at the swift death of so many caused by so few, there was mingled a feeling of amazement at the scientific perfection of the submarine, its power, and its deadly work. Men said it was the end of dreadnoughts, battleships, and cruisers, but the history of the war was shown singularly few of these destroyed by submarines since the first novelty of the attack wore off. The world at the moment seemed to think that the submarine was an entirely new idea and invention, but like almost everything else, it was merely the ultimate reduction of practical use of an idea that had been germinating in the mind of man from the earliest days of history. We need not trouble ourselves with the speculations of Alexander the Great, Aristotle, and Pliny concerning underwater activities. Their active minds gave consideration to the problem, but mainly as to the employment of divers. Not until the first part of the 16th century do we find any very specific reference to actual underwater boats. That appears in a book of travels by Olaus Magnus, Archbishop of Uppsala in Sweden notwithstanding the gentleman's reverent quality one must question somewhat the veracity of the chapter which he heads of the leather ships made of hides used by the pirates of greenland he professed to have seen two of these ships more probably boats hanging in a cathedral church in greenland with these singular vessels according to his veracious reports the people of that country could navigate under water and attack stranger ships from beneath for the inhabitants of that country were wont to get small profits by the spoils of others, he wrote. By these and the like treacherous arts, who by their thieving wit and by boring a hole privately in the sides of the ships beneath, as I said, have let in the water and presently caused them to sink. 
leaving the tale of the archbishop where we think it must belong in the realm of fiction we may note that it was not until the beginning of the seventeenth century that the first submarine boat was actually built and navigated a hollander cornelius drebbel or van drebbel born in fifteen seventy two in the town of alkmaar had come to london during the reign of james i who became his patron and friend Drebbel seems to have been a serious student of science, and in many ways far ahead of his times. Moreover, he had the talent of getting next to royalty. In 1620, he first conceived the idea of building a submarine. Fairly detailed descriptions of his boats, he built three from 1620 to 1624, and of their actual use have been handed down to us by men whose accuracy and truthfulness cannot be doubted the honorable robert boyle a scientist of unquestioned seriousness tells in his new experiments physico-mechanical touching the spring of the air and its effects about drubble's work in the quaint language of his time but yet on occasion of this opinion of paracelsus perhaps it will not be impertinent if before i proceed i acquaint your lordship with the conceit of that deservedly famous mechanician and chemist cornelius drebbel who among other strange things that he performed is affirmed by more than a few credible persons to have contrived for the late learned king james a vessel to go under water of which trial was made in the thames with admired success the vessel carrying twelve rowers besides passengers one which is yet alive and related it to an excellent mathematician that informed me of it now that for which i mention this story is that having had the curiosity and opportunity to make particular inquiries among the relations of drebbel and especially of an ingenious physician that married his daughter concerning the grounds upon which he conceived it feasible to make men unaccustomed to continue so long under water without suffocation or as the lately mentioned person that went in the vessel affirms without inconvenience i was answered that drebbel conceived that it is not the whole body of the air but a certain quintessence as chemists speak or a spiritous part of it that makes it fit for respiration which being spent the remaining grosser body or carcase if i may so call it of the air is unable to cherish the vital flame residing in the heart so that for aught i could gather besides the mechanical contrivances of his vessel he had a chemical liquor which he accounted the chief secret of his submarine navigation for when from time to time he conceived that the finer and purer part of the air was consumed or overclogged by the respiration and steam of those that went in his ship he would be unstopping a vessel full of this liquor speedily restore to the troubled air such a proportion of vital parts as would make it again for a good while fit for respiration whether by dissipating or precipitating the grosser exhalations or by some other intelligible way i must not now stay to examine contenting myself to add that having had the opportunity to do some service to those of his relations that were most intimate with him and having made it my business to learn what this strange liquor might be they constantly affirmed that drebbel would never disclose the liquor unto any nor so much as tell the nature whereof he had made it to above one person who himself assured me what it was this most curious narrative suggests that in some way drebbel who died in london in sixteen thirty four had discovered the art of compressing oxygen and conceived the idea of making it serviceable for freshening the air in a boat or other place contaminated by the respiration of a number of men for a long time indeed the reference made to the substance by which drebbel purified the atmosphere in his submarine as a liquor suggests that he may possibly have hit upon the secret of liquid air which late in the nineteenth century caused such a stir in the united states of his profession of some such secret there can be no doubt whatsoever for samuel pepys refers in his famous diary to a lawsuit brought in the king's courts by the heirs of drebbel to secure the secret for their own use what was the outcome of the suit, or the subsequent history of Drebbel's invention, history does not record. Throughout the next 150 years, a large number of inventors and near inventors occupied themselves with the problem of the submarine. Some of these men went no further than to draw plans and to write out descriptions of what appeared to them to be feasible submarine boats. 
Others took one step further by taking out patents, but only very few of the submarine engineers of this period had either the means or the courage to test their inventions in the only practicable way by building an experimental boat and using it. In spite of this apparent lack of faith on the part of the men who worked on the submarine problem, it would not be fair to condemn them as fakers. Experimental workers, in those times, had to face many difficulties which were removed in later times. The study of science and the examination of the forces of nature were not only not as popular as they became later, but frequently were looked upon as blasphemous, savoring of sorcery, or as a sign of an unbalanced mind. England and France supplied most of the men who occupied themselves with the submarine problem between 1610 and 1760. Of the Englishmen, the following left records of one kind or another concerning their labors in this direction. Richard Norwood, in 1632, was granted a patent for a contrivance which was apparently little more than a diving apparatus. In 1648, Bishop Wilkins published a book, Mathematical Magic, which was full of rather grotesque projects and which contained one chapter on the possibility of framing an arc for submarine navigation. In 1691, patents were granted on engines connected with submarine navigation to John Holland, curious forerunner of a name destined to be famous 200 years later, and on a submarine boat to Sir Stephen Evans. In France, two priests, Fathers Mersenne and Fournier, published in 1634 a small book called Questions Theologiques, Physique, Morale et Mathematique, which contained a detailed description of a submarine boat. They suggested that the hull of submarines ought to be of metal and not of wood, and that their shape ought to be as nearly fish-like as possible. Nearly three hundred years have hardly altered these opinions. Ancient French records also tell us that six years later, in 1640, the King of France had granted a patent to Jean Barry, permitting him, during the next twelve years, to fish at the bottom of the sea with his boat. Unluckily, Barry's fish stories have expired with his permit. In 1654, a French designer, Desson, is said to have built at Rotterdam a submarine boat. Little is known concerning this vessel, except that it was reported to have been 72 feet long, 12 feet high, and 8 feet broad, and to have been propelled by a paddle wheel instead of oars. Borelli, about whom very little seems to be known, is credited with having invented in 1680 a submarine boat, whose descent and ascent were regulated by a series of leather bottles placed in the hull of the boat with their mouths open to the surrounding water. The English magazine, Graphic, published a picture which is considered the oldest known illustration of any submarine boat. This picture matches in all details the description of Borelli's boat, but it is credited to a man called Simmons. Twenty-seven years later, in 1774, another Englishman, J. Day, built a small submarine boat and, after fairly extensive experiments, descended in his boat in Plymouth Harbor. This descent is of special interest because we have a more detailed record of it than of any previous submarine exploit, and because Day is the first submarine inventor who lost his life in the attempt to prove the feasibility of his invention. The Annual Register of 1774 gives a narration in detail of Day's experiments and death, and inasmuch as this is the first ungarbled report of a submarine descent, it may be quoted at length. Authentic account of a late unfortunate transaction with respect to a diving machine at Plymouth. Mr. Day, the sole projector of the scheme, and, as matters have turned out, the unhappy sacrifice to his own ingenuity, employed his thoughts for some years past in planning a method of sinking a vessel under water with a man in it who should live therein for a certain time, and then, by his own means only, bring himself up to the surface. After much study, he conceived that his plan could be reduced into practice. He communicated his idea in the part of the country where he lived, and had the most sanguine hopes of success. He went so far as to try his project in the broads near Yarmouth. He fitted a Norwich market boat for his purpose, sunk himself thirty feet under water, where he continued during the space of twenty-four hours, and executed his design to his own entire satisfaction. Elated with this success, he then wanted to avail himself of his invention. 
He conversed with his friends, convinced them that he had brought his undertaking to a certainty, but how to reap the advantage of it was the difficulty that remained. The person in whom he confided suggested to him that, if he acquainted the sporting gentleman with the discovery and the certainty of the performance, considerable bets would take place, as soon as the project would be mentioned in company. The sporting calendar was immediately looked into, and the name of Blake soon occurred. That gentleman was fixed upon as the person to whom Mr. Day ought to address himself. Accordingly, Mr. Blake, in the month of November last, received the following letter. Sir, I found out an affair by which many thousands may be won. It is of a paradoxical nature, but can be performed with ease. Therefore, sir, if you choose to be informed of it, and give me one hundred pounds of every thousand you shall win by it, I will very readily wait upon you and inform you of it. I am myself but a poor mechanic, and not able to make anything by it without your assistance. Yours, etc., J. Day. Mr. Blake had no conception of Mr. Day's design, nor was he sure that the letter was serious. To clear the matter up, he returned for answer that, if Mr. Day would come to town and explain himself, Mr. Blake would consider of the proposal. If he approved of it, Mr. Day should have the recompense he desired. If, on the other hand, the plan should be rejected, Mr. Blake would make him a present to defray the expenses of his journey. In a short time after Mr. Day came to town, Mr. Blake saw him and desired to know what secret he was possessed of. The man replied that he could sink a ship 100 feet deep in the sea with himself in it and remain therein for the space of 24 hours without communication with anything above and at the expiration of that time rise up again in the vessel. The proposal in all its parts was new to Mr. Blake. He took down the particulars and after considering the matter desired some kind of proof of practicability. The man added that if Mr. Blake would furnish him with the materials necessary, he would give him an ocular demonstration. A model of the vessel with which he was to perform the experiment was then required, and in three or four weeks accomplished, so as to give a perfect idea of the principle upon which the scheme was to be executed, and in time a very plausible promise of success, not to Mr. Blake only, but many other gentlemen who were consulted upon the occasion. The consequence was that Mr. Blake, agreeably to the man's desire, advanced money for the construction of a vessel fit for that purpose. Mr. Day, thus assisted, went to Plymouth with his model and sent a man in that place to work upon it. The pressure of the water at 100 feet deep was a circumstance of which Mr. Blake was advised, and, touching that article, he gave the strongest precautions to Mr. Day, telling him, at any expense, to fortify the chamber in which he was to subsist against the weight of such a body of water. Mr. Day set off in great spirits for Plymouth, and seemed so confident that Mr. Blake made a bet that the project would succeed reducing, however, the depth of water from 100 yards to 100 feet, and the time from 24 to 12 hours. By the terms of the wager, the experiment was to be made within three months from the date, but so much time was necessary for due preparation that on the appointed day things were not in readiness and Mr. Blake lost the bet. In some short time afterwards, the vessel was finished, and Mr. Day still continued eager for the carrying of his plan into execution. He was uneasy at the idea of dropping the scheme and wished for an opportunity to convince Mr. Blake that he could perform what he had undertaken. He wrote from Plymouth that everything was in readiness and should be executed the moment Mr. Blake arrived. Induced by this promise, Mr. Blake set out for Plymouth. Upon his arrival, a trial was made in Catwater, where Mr. Day lay during the flow of tide six hours and six more during the tide of ebb confined all the time in the room appropriated for his use. A day for the final determination was fixed. The vessel was towed to the place agreed upon. Mr. Day provided himself with whatever he thought necessary. He went into the vessel, let the water into her, and with great composure retired to the room constructed for him, and shut up the valve. The ship went gradually down in twenty-two fathoms of water at two o'clock on Tuesday, June twenty-eighth, in the afternoon, being to return at two the next morning. 
he had three buoys or messengers which he could send to the surface at option to announce his situation below but none appearing mr blake who was near at hand in a barge began to entertain some suspicion he kept a strict lookout and at the time appointed neither the buoys nor the vessel coming up he applied to the orpheus frigate which lay just off the barge for assistance the captain with the most ready benevolence supplied them with everything in his power to seek for the ship mr blake in this alarming situation was not content with the help of the orpheus only he made immediate application to lord sandwich who happened to be at plymouth for further relief his lordship with great humanity ordered a number of hands from the dockyard who went with the utmost alacrity and tried every effort to regain the ship but unhappily without effect thus ended this unfortunate affair mr blake had not experience enough to judge of all possible contingencies and he had now only to lament the credulity with which he listened to a projector fond of his own scheme but certainly not possessed of skill enough to guard against the variety of accidents to which he was liable the poor man has unfortunately shortened his days he was not however tempted or influenced by anybody he confided in his own judgment and put his life to the hazard upon his own mistaken notions end of beginnings of submarine invention part one recording by william tomcoe